Sean McDowell is a well-respected Christian apologist with a PhD in apologetics and worldview studies, and he has a very large presence here on YouTube, where he discusses a wide variety of topics. Today, he's going to discuss the topic of morality and argue that moral statements like, we ought not murder, can be objectively true. But the funny thing is, Sean McDowell ends up doing exactly what he accuses other people of doing. He changes his definition of truth depending on the topic of the conversation. It's uncontroversial to say that some statements are objectively true, such as smoking increases cancer risk and brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. But these are examples of descriptive statements, which describe the way things are. When it comes to prescriptive statements about the way things should be, it's much less clear which of them, if any, are objectively true. This is where Sean McDowell enters the picture. Sean McDowell believes that some statements about the way things should be are objectively true, specifically what he calls moral statements. Examples of these types of statements include we ought not murder and abortion is wrong. So, in order to determine if these types of prescriptive moral statements can be objectively true, the question we need to answer is, what does it mean for a statement to be objective and true? How can we tell if any statement is objectively true? As it turns out, Sean does a very good job of explaining this in the first part of his talk, before circling back to talk about moral statements specifically. Sean first spends some time talking about what makes a statement true. Specifically, he explains the theory of truth called the correspondence theory, which basically says that a statement is true if it corresponds to, if it accurately describes, some feature of reality. The correspondence theory of truth says a statement is true if it matches up with reality. So truth is when you describe the world as it actually is. We make statements and we go see if the world is the way we have described it to be. And if I told you I drove here this morning in 22 minutes, well, the reason I did it is because I drove in my new red 2011 Lamborghini. Now you walk outside and you see that, my statement would be true. Now if you walk outside and you see this, my statement would be false, why? Because it's yellow and I said that it was red. In general, and among surveyed philosophers in 2020, it does appear that the correspondence theory of truth is the most popular view, and on the whole, I agree with Sean's explanation of it. A statement is true if it accurately describes something that exists in reality. Next, Sean explains the difference between subjective statements and objective statements, and I agree with this explanation as well. In simple terms, subjective statements are statements which describe an opinion or a preference or some other kind of mental feeling. Objective statements, by contrast, are statements which describe an external, non-mental thing, such as an object, event, or measurement. Now what if I said, chocolate peanut butter ice cream controls diabetes? You see, this isn't a claim about my preferences, like ice cream. This is an objective claim about the way the world actually operates in itself. So now, when we put together what we've learned about objective statements and true statements, we can see what it means to say that a statement is both objective and true. To say that a statement is objective and true is to say that the statement accurately describes some object or event which exists out in the world. For example, the statement, water is H2O, is objectively true because it accurately describes the atomic structure of water, which is a structure whose existence is external to our minds. It's something we can go out and point to in the world. Subjective truths are personal or private, or as it said in the film, opinion, and they can change. That's what subjective truth is. It's internal as opposed to being external in the world. Now, subjective truth refers to the subject. Objective truth refers to the object. It's a fact about the world that we discover 
we don't change it. Now, as you'll recall, the topic of Sean's talk is morality, specifically objective morality, which Sean believes exists and which he is trying to prove to his audience. So the key question is whether or not moral statements, that is, prescriptive ought statements, can be objectively true, in the same way that other statements can be objectively true. Are moral claims dealing with objective reality that exists in the world outside of our thinking? Or are all moral claims internal preference claims about what we like or what we don't like? So now that Sean has explained in detail what the standard is for a statement to be considered objectively true, he is going to apply that standard to moral statements in order to prove that moral statements can be objectively true. People often ask, how do we know that certain things are wrong? And the answer is what? It's obvious. Wait, what? It's self-evident. It's self-evident that such an act is wrong. You see, again, it's written on our hearts. It's obvious once we know the nature of it. It's self-evident. It's obvious once we reflect upon the issue. Yep, and just like that, Sean McDowell suddenly does not care about his own definition of objective truth. When the topic shifts to morality, when the question is whether or not moral statements can be objectively true, Sean McDowell doesn't see any need to point to external, non-mental things to which moral statements refer. Instead, Sean McDowell simply asserts that moral statements can be objectively true if they are self-evident or if everyone just knows them. No external correspondence needed, their objective truth is just obvious. Obvious! So if he's not going to use his own standard of objective truth, what standard is he going to use? Well, let's see what arguments he presents. Let's see if he can prove that some moral statements are objectively true. If there is no objective standard of morality, then can we judge anybody? for doing anything. I don't know, Sean. If there is no objective standard of tall, then can we really say that a building is tall? If there is no objective standard for a long amount of time, then can we really say that a movie is long? I guess not, right? If there's no objective standard, then no buildings are tall, no movies are long, and we cannot render any judgments about these things. Do you see how ridiculous that sounds? It is perfectly reasonable to make relative judgments, even if it doesn't provide a comforting, absolute feeling in your heart. If morality is like ice cream, we have no more right to tell, make moral judgments than we do to make judgments about somebody's ice cream preference. Ah yes, this is a classic, the argument that moral statements are objectively true because the world would be a scary place otherwise. If morality isn't objective, then everyone can just do whatever they want, right? The thing is, Sean, the world is already a scary place because everyone is already doing whatever they want. Or, to be more accurate, people are already doing whatever they most want. Sure, I want to have a lot of money, but to an even greater degree, I want to avoid the risk of jail and the feelings of guilt that would come from stealing money which is ultimately why I don't do it. This is something I discussed in detail in my video Moral Philosophy is Not Body Armor. Even if objective morality exists, people are still just going to do whatever they want, and your objective moral condemnation is not going to stop them if they simply value their personal goals more than they value being logically consistent. Your moral philosophy is not some kind of body armor, nor is it some kind of club that you can use to keep people in line. Look, if you climb on top of this building, you jump off and you think you can fly, there's something objective called gravity that is gonna have something else to say. And we don't wanna clean you up. Just as there's laws of gravity that are, exist in the objective world outside of us, there are laws of morality that exist objectively as a transcendent standard. standard beyond all of us. Cool. Now show me an object which proves the existence of moral laws. Just as Galileo could drop things from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to prove gravitational laws, Sean should be able to point to something equally objective and non-mental to prove moral laws. 
Sean compares moral laws to physical laws, not because he's applying a consistent standard of objective truth, but because he wants to give his audience the impression that moral laws are just as forceful and universal as physical laws. This part of his talk is a manipulative advertisement, except that instead of a beer framed by a pretty woman, it's Sean's moral preferences framed by the laws of physics. That beer seems really good looking, and Sean's moral preferences seem really objective, don't they? Torturing an innocent child for fun is universally wrong. And anybody who understands the nature of a child, anybody who understands the nature of a torture and understands the nature of fun, if you put those together, it's self-evident that such an act is wrong. Just like we look at two plus two, and it's obvious once we know the nature of it, that it equals four. But Sean, we can objectively prove that two plus two equals four. In fact, here, follow along, Sean, pay very close attention. How many little tugboats do I have in this glass? That's right, I have two. Now, how many little tugboats do I have in this glass? That's right, I have two as well. Now, what happens when I put them together? How many tugboats do I have? That's right, I have one, two, three, four. Look at that, two plus two objectively equals four. Okay, now it's your turn. Can you show me some objects, some mind external things, which I can go look at, which prove that children plus torture plus fun equals wrong? Y you can't? It's just a feeling in your heart? But I thought you said that moral statements are objective, just like how the statement two plus two equals four is objective. Hmm. It's obvious once we reflect upon the issue. In fact, this is why philosopher William Lane Craig says, if you don't think rape is evil, you don't need an argument. You need therapy. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said you could prove that a statement like rape is evil is objectively true. Surely you don't need to rely on hypothetical insults to prove the truth of this statement, right? Surely you can actually point to something in the external world, the external world. to which this moral statement refers, right? You want to know what somebody really believes in their heart about the objective status of morality? It's not by what they say, it's not by what they do, but by how they want to be treated. Everybody wants to be treated as if morality is an objective feature of the universe. Okay, sure, everyone wants to be treated as if morality is an objective feature of the universe, but is morality actually an objective feature of the universe? Or is it just wishful thinking we all engage in? You haven't actually explained how to tell the difference. Proving that everyone wants morality to be an objective feature of the universe is not the same thing as proving that morality is an objective feature of the universe. As C.S. Lewis would say, if somebody says there's no such thing as objective morality, cut in front of them in line. What's their response going to be? Oh, wait a minute, I got here first. As if there's some transcendent moral standard that you and I are both obligated to, and the first person who is there has the moral right to go first. By this reasoning, you could prove that our sense of taste is objective. In fact, let's do it. You know, there's so many people in our modern secular culture who like to say that taste is a subjective, personal opinion. But whenever someone says this, you know what? I don't believe them. In fact, the next time someone says that taste is just a personal preference and that there's no such thing as objectively good or bad tasting things, poop in their mouth. No, seriously, what are they going to say? That tastes horrible, that is a terrible tasting thing, as if there's really an objective standard of taste that you are expected to recognize. So you can see that taste is an objective feature of the universe. It's self-evident. We all know that certain things are objectively bad tasting. And you know what? If taste was subjective, then no one would be able to judge anyone else's cooking. Our entire food supply would be thrown into chaos because no one would be able to say that the food they bought tastes horrible. What's their standard? They would just have to accept it and struggle to eat it. See, this proves that our sense of taste is objective. Right? Hopefully, you don't agree with this argument about objective taste. But where did I go wrong? 
Well, I didn't actually point to some external feature of reality to which statements about taste refer, did I? I just played up the fact that most people share a strong subjective preference, and the fact that most people speak as if certain tastes are objectively bad, and then I described how scared I was about what would happen if taste wasn't objective. Ultimately, this is all that Sean McDowell can do when it comes to objective morality. He cannot fulfill his own standard of objective truth when it comes to moral statements, so he instead appeals to wishful thinking and fear-mongering, and hopes that no one will notice his double standard. But as it turns out, Sean McDowell is not simply applying a double standard, he is being a hypocrite. As we've now thoroughly seen, when the topic shifted to morality, Sean McDowell changed what he meant by objective truth. And here he is, just ten minutes earlier in the same talk, accusing other people of changing what they mean by objective truth as soon as the topic shifts to morality. As soon as the topic shifts to morality, or as soon as the topic shifts to religion, people will change what is meant by truth. Look in the mirror! This really boggles my mind. Sean McDowell is not stupid. He does understand what it means for a statement to be objectively true. Sean is also not compartmentalizing. He does understand that the definition of objective truth he outlined is applicable to discussions about morality. And yet, he changes what is meant by objective truth when the topic shifts to morality. I can only conclude that Sean McDowell simply does not care about being consistent on the topic of morality. I can only conclude that Sean McDowell knows that he's being dishonest. If I had to guess, I would say that Sean McDowell is just so convinced in his heart that his moral feelings must be meaningful in some deeper way whether it's because he feels them really strongly, or because he's scared of what might happen otherwise. As a result, he doesn't really care about the arguments. All he cares about is leading people to his conclusion any way he can, even if it means abandoning his own standard for what makes a statement objectively true. Sean McDowell's explanation of what makes a statement objectively true was very good, but it forced him to write a meta-ethical check which he knows he cannot cash.